Well, everybody, welcome. My name is Michael Thiessen. Welcome to Open Mic with Michael Thiessen. <laughs> yes. If you don't know what I mean by that, there is a podcast. It's called Open Mic with Michael Thiessen. You can go to your phone right now and go to your Apple iStore or wherever Apple Podcasts, or you can go to the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network where we at Liberty Coalition Canada put about four podcasts, um, four different shows up there on a regular basis. Uh, tonight we're going to be shooting live. We hope that you will leave the Q&A from here and just immediately go to your phones or your screens or your television at home because we're going to go out there and shoot live right after the premiere. And when Jacob is done answering your questions on stage, he's going to come over there and come on live where we make fun of all of the editorial problems with the film. That's... Um, I'm, I'm excited to be here with you. I'm in the same way that we heard Pastor Tobias um, talk about Trinity and Jacob's generosity. I just want to say, if you're a Trinity member, we are thankful for you and... I'm personally thankful uh, for Jacob making sure that we are able to come up here and be with you all. Uh, it, your church has been a blessing to many, and uh, Jacob and Joanna have been a, a sincere blessing to us. And so thank you if you're from Trinity. Thank you very much for your generosity to have us all here. Okay, so, uh, you know, back in September, Jacob gave me a phone call and said, hey, have you guys done any work on digital ID? And I said, yeah, I, I, we have done work on it. We've done a few podcasts on it, and I haven't put everything together yet. And he said, I would really like you to, you know, bring a, a session on what's going on around digital ID. Now, uh, full disclosure... Everything that I've got here, if you are watching and listening and researching, you've probably found it because nothing about the digital ID program coming to Ontario in 2022, now delayed until the spring of 2023, absolutely nothing is being hidden. Um, you are going to see that... Um, we can find virtually all of this within just some diligent research. So before me, right, uh, before you're up here, um, this is uh, the EID Mean uh, Me Digital ID in the fall of 2017. An Ottawa-based uh, balloon company won a $1.2 million contract from the Ontario government to develop an app uh, to store government issue ID cards on users' smartphones. If we fast forward to 2020, the company has launched this program, eID.me, for uh, iOS and Android, allowing residents of Ontario to store their driver's licenses, passports, photo IDs, all securely on their smartphones. This is what the company said. Our goal is to improve access to services that require verified, identi identi verified identity, including government, financial, health care, legal, and more, uh, said Steve Borza from the company. Once integrations are in place, EIDME could prevent identity fraud in financial services, which become more likely due to the millions of leaked social insurance numbers and other information such as that. And so what we have here uh, before you is coming next year. And there's two things you want to be aware of. We're going to talk about them both. You, you need uh, Ontario and then our federal government. But what you need to know today is that our province of Ontario is passionately attempting to be the forerunner of digital ID in this country. It's actually the Ford government that is pushing for this faster than the federal government. Um, every once in a while, because of our public advocacy work, I get a little bird that whispers in my ear, and people always want to know, who's your bird? And I say, look, so we don't reveal your sources. 
But we've got a number of people who just once in a while, very randomly, would just see, tell us what went by their desk. And this is coming, and it's coming quick, and the government is passionate about it. Digital ID in Ontario. Let's learn about Ontario's digital identity program, which introduces new, con a new convenient way to prove who you are that will make accessing online and in-person services simpler, safer, and more secure. It, uh, there's key words I want you to write down. You can put them together later, but access is a key word. It's something that is, is projected as a neutral positive virtue, but never mention what happens if access is denied. So they're going to say, hey, you want to access something quickly? You, you sign up for this. And you go, great, I want to access stuff quickly. And then they just don't talk about what we're going to see going on later on. So digital ID is an electric version of trusted government identification that proves better safety, more security, and stronger privacy than physical identity cards or documents. The website goes on to explain, um, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to tell you guys when I want to switch sides, eh? It's okay. So ready? There we go. Um, the government goes on to explain what digital ID is and then what digital ID is not. So digital ID is convenient. Let's all clap every time we hear one of these things, just for, it's secure, you know. Okay, we don't. It's uh, privacy preserving. It's verifiable. It's in your control. Exactly. We're going to talk about we're going to talk about how ridiculous this gets so quickly, um, and it's voluntary. Now, I I will read that out because, like, again, you all know where this is going, and that's the difficulty because when when you're listening and you're watching the world, when they say it's voluntary, you go, what what's the words that you say when it's voluntary? You you say two words after that sentence. Ready? It's voluntary. For now, every, like, there's no one in the room that doesn't know those two words, for now. And they're going to sell it authentically for now. Uh, so, what they say is digital ID is not, uh, they say not stored in a central database. Your digital ID is stored only on your personal mobile device, for example, your phone or your tablet or computer, and can be turned off remotely if your device or computer is stolen. Okay, ready? Write these words down. Turned off remotely. Like they're selling it on the one side, you can turn it off remotely, and it's not in a database for now. It's not a tracking device. The government will not know where you have been or where you used your digital, digital ID. Are there children in the room? Because I just want to cuss. My left cheek, they're not going to know. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's one of those Disney ones where you, you can say it, not everybody in the room gets it. <laughs> not usable without your permission. Now, you got to remember, this is in a year where we have seen the federal government admit and acknowledge that our military did psychological warfare analysis on us, and at the same time, um, we saw that our federal government tracked our movements so they could figure out our buying habits, whether we were being compliant. Like, Dr. Teresa Tam has acknowledged that they wanted to see what we were doing during lockdowns. Okay. So, this is the progress so far. And again, some of you who have been to the Ontario.ca website and read about digital ID, you're like, this is the most uninformative lecture I've ever heard. It's right there. That's because it's right there. So our progress, and they just go through. They've published a set of technological tools. They've held online consultation. Um, they've uh, produced a technology roadmap. Um, I want you to write two other words down, private sector partners and key stakeholders. I don't think key stakeholders is on this slide. It's going to come up later. But 
private sector partners and key stakeholders, because you're going to see how dangerous things become when those two worlds collide uh, over the implementation. Again, I'm just getting all of this off of Ontario.ca Digital ID uh, Ontario. Okay. Now we go to the federal world. So now we're going to the federal government. So there is uh, an organization called the Known Traveler Digital Identity. Anybody familiar with this website or, or whatnot? Okay, so um, I'm going to read a little bit from uh, a, a corporate traveler community report. It was published in 2019, and it just says this. The World Economic Forum and the governments of the Netherlands and Canada have launched the first pilot project for paperless travel between two countries. The known traveler digital ID uses a traveler-managed digital ID for international paperless travel. The pilot initiative is a collaboration between government and industry, border authorities, airports, te te technology providers, and airlines to create an interoperable system for secure and seamless travel. It will be integrated with partner systems and tested internally through 2019 with the first end-to-end -end paperless journey expected to take place in 2020. By 2030, international air travel is expected to rise to 1.8 billion traveler, uh, passengers, up to 50% from 2016. With current systems, airports cannot keep up. Uh, this is Christopher Wolf. Uh, I don't like typical Germans playing their hand, naming their children wolves. Ch uh, Christopher Wolf, <laughs> head of the mobility at the World Economic Forum, and he says this, the project offers a solution by using interoperable digital IDs. Passengers benefit from a holistic system for secure and seamless travel. It will help shape the future of aviation security. Now, I really just want you to see this because this is, uh, this is something, vi I don't want to say it's visually disturbing, but it's visually revealing. Go to the next slide. And this is their website. Like, pilot partners. Can everybody read the box right here? World Economic Forum. Can you just look to the right a little bit? <laughs> Canada. Like, at least the guys from the government of Netherlands, at least they're like, can you make sure our font is super, super small <laughs> on the website? Like, just for those people who don't take a deeper look. Oh, wait, and it's not just that, right? You see the coinciding airlines and, and uh, uh, port authorities and um, airports in the countries. Like, I don't know about you, but when 2020 started and I heard this whisper about the Great Reset, a bunch of us went out and bought the book because it was like, well, I guess we should read it just in case it's a thing. And... Here we are in reality where we're finding out more and more that this is a deeply embedded think tank that controls global leaders. And Canada is a key partner. Key partner. Now, if anybody says to you, what do you think Justin Trudeau's doing? The answer is he's doing what China and Klaus Schwab want him to do. That's it. Like, you don't even have to say that nefariously, because if someone were to say, what's Justin Trudeau doing? And the real answer is he's doing what Michael Thiessen and Joe Boot and Jacob Rayum and Aaron Rock tell him to do, I wouldn't mind so much. <laughs> he's literally a disciple of teachers who are implementing a global vision of the world, and they're test piloting things. Have you ever heard of proof of concept? Canada is a proof of concept. On their website, the Known Traveler Digital ID, or KTDI, 
for short form, is a World Economic Forum initiative that brings together the global consortium of individuals, governments, authorities, and the travel industry to enhance security in world travel. The first global collaboration of its kind, KTDI, enables more secure and more seamless travel that benefits both travelers and the travel industry. KTDI enables consortium partners, key stakeholders, partner players, and admittedly not everything is nefarious. There are people who have vested interests in you getting from A to B to access verifiable claims of a traveler's identity data so they can assess their credibility and optimize passenger processing and reduce risk. Please listen to every single word that I'm about to say, uh, let you know there. Ready? Verify claims. Assess credibility. And reduce risk. Those are three words you need to listen to very carefully as we go through another country that is far further along in the test pilot situation because they're likely driving the whole thing. We're going to talk about China. But when you, you, know, when you say very... So I made the mistake this week of watching one of those border control... Have you ever watched like catching drug smugglers in Madrid? Anybody actually watch that one? Catching drug smugglers in Madrid. It's terrifying. Like, people at the airport, there's a thousand police officers uh, in Spain at this one airport, and they all are just there to catch people lying. And they're really good at it. It was a mistake to watch it, because going over back and forth over the border, now I'm terrified. <laughs> but when we think, oh, let's verify claims, it's like, is this a legit passport? Are you the person that is supposed to be holding this passport? And when you tell me that you're not bringing or traveling with anything illegal, are you doing that? That's when we say verify credibility. But what we're going to learn very quickly and what we've learned during COVID-19, that the further down the road we go, verifying credibility is, do I like your political views or don't I? Are you, did, you, did you do all of the things that the mandates told you to do down to a T, even in your home? And the reach is so far in that all of these, again, these nice management words, and we're going to get to a slide that I'm pretty sure is blank. It's just going to have a picture of a book. No, it's not here yet. Um, and that's just because I didn't, I, I wasn't able to get into the book, but I want to introduce you a book that just talks about the selling is consumerism. They're selling us on all of these things under the guise of expedient consumerism. So you always have to listen to these words because when they say reduce risk, they don't mean reduce risk of you carrying a gun and bombing someone. Yes, that is one aspect of reducing risk. We're getting down to reducing risk of, well, what's your temperature of your body? Okay, now to the next slide. So here's a really another important word you need to write down, attestations. Attestations are added to the traveler's KTDI profile each time a trusted entity verifies a claim pertaining to the individual. So you start getting a list of someone, you've said this, you've attested to this, and someone's verified it. These attestations are the backbone of trust and the basis of reputation and ultimately how security decisions are made by each participating organization. The more attestations a traveler collects, the more known he or she could become, which enables individualized risk-based different, uh, differentiation in border management and aviation security screening. The more you tell us 
the faster we can process you, or, it says right in the, or the more we can just manage how we'd like to manage you. Now again, if I bring my Canadian passport to the Canadian border, there have always been attestations. Are you who you say you are? Is this a legit document? Are you carrying firearms? Are you carrying more than $10,000 cash? And are you carrying firearms? Those have always been legit attestations. What they're referring to with attestations is that every time you travel and with multiple organizations. So now it doesn't matter your relationship to Canada. You can be in Germany or in the Netherlands, or it could be a private business, or what, the more at, it could be shopping at the airport uh, duty-free shop because they're bringing in private partners in order for you to have more attestations. It goes on to, and, and by the way, already, so this is the federal program, right? What, what, what was one of the first things that I told you to write down? Or what, one of the first things they said that digital ID was not? Yeah, it wasn't centralized. What's going on federally? It's all centralized. Everybody's putting your information somewhere so that your list of attestations grows. Well, wait a minute. What about my ID not being tracked? What about my ID not being late? So, it, so it's all bait and switch. The provincial government says, well, we're going to do this. And it's never going to be centralized. Literally, while at the same time, our Canadian government has a centralized database that's collecting attestations. Uh, second paragraph, uh, moving to the next slide. The traveler, go, one, yeah, there we go. The traveler will be able to share information with stakeholders. There's that word again, or for the, maybe for the first time, but stakeholders, key partners, on need to know or authorized to know basis to decide what information to share and when and with whom to share it according to the travel requirements of the participating consortium partners. So just the amount of information. A little, little bit of a thought experiment for you. I want you to try this. Everybody needs to go try this in the next year just to just have some fun, okay? Go into a hotel and try to stay there by paying cash and not giving any information. It's the most fun thing that I do. Just walk in. <laughs> And walk up, do you have a reservation? No. Okay, what's your name? I don't want to give you my name. How much do I have to pay to just give you, like, is it, five, if I put $500, I do it all the time. And they don't know what to do about it. Because we're so used to sharing information. And now it's coming to another level. All of these partners are getting involved with your digital ID. Um, there's a next slide is about blockchain. So they do talk about blockchain and why blockchain is important. So blockchain technology, I just want you to listen to the words, show great promise. Whenever you see the words show great promise, that means that they're untested and unverifiable. Um, it's, it, it, at its most basic level, a blockchain is a new type of database system that maintains and records data in a way that allows multiple stakeholders to confidently and securely share access to the same information. Again, centralized. Okay. So um, just further along, uh, I've been very disappointed with, with many of our MPs in the last two years, as many of you have. Uh, Leslin Lewis is one of those MPs that I wish would have been doing more for conservatism early on, uh, but she has uh, seemed to find her voice a little bit more right now, and so uh, she did an inquiry of ministry request where she inquired about whether or not this is legitimately happening, like this website is publishing that it's happening. And uh, this is what we found, uh, second paragraph in the next slide. Transport Canada has to date spent $428,671 on salaries and $220,830 on non-salaries. With respect to non-salaries, the breakdown is as follows. 
the most important thing. Budget 2021 proposed $105.3 million over five years, starting in 2021 and 2022, with $28.7 million in remaining amateurization and $10.2 million per year ongoing to Transport Canada to collaborate with international partners to further the events of the KTDI pilot project. So Canada's all in for this. Canada's all in. You can probably add up the numbers better than I can, but you see how it goes from 105 million, is that a breakdown? Or is the 10.2 million per year you know, further and beyond that? But Canada's, Canada's really invested in this. Now, here's the slide, the next slide, that has no text, my apologies. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to get into chapter three of the book, Live Not By Lies. How many of you have read Live Not By Lies? Good, for those of you who haven't, this is a key resource in the coming years. Live not by lies. Um, Tony just did a lecture on Roman Catholicism, and live not by lies is a study of a number of Catholic believers who um, uh, lived during, uh, uh, during Russian communism and li- the, the, the rise of the Soviet Union and how they responded and the whole book can rightly be summarized in the idea they had to learn to live not by lies. One question I want to ask Tony, and I, I told him I would have asked this if we had Q&A, was why is it that I like so many Catholics more than I like most of my evangelical friends right now? And so I really appreciate that we are here talking about the need to evangelize them because you will have a great ability to evangelize Catholics sincerely with the gospel and correct their doctrinal error because they are a people group that does have a formulated worldview and an understanding of things like family and state. And so there's error there, but you have an opportunity to disciple the more and more we talk about socialism creeping in. So Dreyer has a chapter Uh, chapter three on the communist social credit system. We're going to talk a lot about it right now. And I recommend that chapter. Don't read it if you're for the faint of heart. And basically, anybody who is overly paranoid and not sleeping at night right now, you should just get up and leave and go to Eric's fun-hearted track of Bruxy Cavey because we're about to look at China. So all of the things that you've seen, and I want try really hard to listen to similar language, because China, of course, um, has implemented since 2019 their social credit system. What happened in letter 2019 in China? I can't remember. <laughs> wow, we introduce a credit, a social credit score system. And then it just so happens that we have a pandemic that tracks every single thing you could possibly do for the sake of your own health. I wonder if those two events coincided at all. Probably not. (laughs) So, uh, very shockingly, CNN, shockingly, and so again, most of this is probably um, information that they want us to know Um, if the leftist media is so openly reporting about it. But Nectar uh, Gan has done a number of articles over the last number of years, and she just most recently, uh, in 2022, put out two two short films about the the social uh, credit score system. And uh, CNN's actually provided some good information on this. So this is uh, from an article published May 25th, um, 2020. Is there a way for me to get power up here to my laptop? Because my laptop's telling me that it wants power. I think if there's... Talk amongst yourselves for a moment while I plug in my laptop. There we go. Okay, so in May of 2025, 
she published an article saying, imagine a smartphone app that has access to your medical records and assigns you a daily score based on your preconditions, recent checkups and lifestyle habits, how much you've drunk, smoked, exercised, and slept on any given day can all affect your points total, boosting or lowering your ranking. She goes on to say, the health, core, the health score will be embedded in, and this is where we have it on the slide, we will be embedded on a digital QR code accessible on your phone, ready to be scanned wherever needed. So I've told you, key partners, stakeholders, private organizations, under that same category, write down, wherever needed. Inspired by a health code system it adopted during the COVID-19 pandemic to profile people based on their risk of infection, she goes on to say, across the globe, governments have stepped up the collection of personal data. And so she talks about the city of Hangzhou in eastern China and how they have implemented this over their 10 million residents, this health score. Again, and I'm starting here logically for a reason. Their health score quickly morphed into their social credit system, in fact, synonymously, because the one was the Trojan horse for the other, or in this case, just the parallel horse, just to get everybody used to it. She goes on to say in her article, but there are also fears that some of these extraordinary measures could, be, could stay here even after the public health crisis is over, posing a long-term threat. This is my favorite paragraph. That concern was amplified among Hangzhou residents when their municipal government announced Friday that it's planning to make permanent a, a version of the health code. So people are concerned and that was amplified when the government said, yes, you should be concerned. It's going to be permanent. She goes on to give a, a demonstration. CNN international correspondent David Culver shows his health QR code in Shanghai. A green code means he's healthy and safe to travel. Since February, the Chinese government has used a colored-based health code system to control people's movements and curb the spread of the coronavirus. The automatically generated quick response codes, commonly abbreviated to QR codes, are assigned to citizens on their smartphones as an indicator of their health status. The color of these codes in red, amber, and green decides whether users can leave home, use public transport, or enter public spaces. So that's just a picture of his phone. And then this is the daily score that you see on your phone. This is how it reads out. So daily exercise, 15,000 steps. You get five points. Daily drinking, Chinese, apparently Chinese liquor is bad for you. <laughs> they, don't, they specify it's Chinese liquor, so okay. Uh, and then daily smoking and daily sleep. So this is a report on you, your daily habits. Now, just at the same time, and I want to, I'm going to note for you the, the dates of these articles that has been shared, just at the same time, China's social credit score system became a reality. So this is an article written in 2019, so you've got to remember the timing of all of this. And so this is from the article. I've just got a number of quotes for you because I find the quotes are the, the most informative. In China, you can tell that a government project is a big deal when it gets its own theme song and music video. This year, the honor, that honor goes to the social credit system scheduled to be in full effect by 2020 according to the China Internet Report 2019. Detailed in a policy document published back in 2014, social credit is intended as a carrot and stick mechanism for the country's more than 1.4 billion citizens. It punishes individuals and businesses who fail to follow rules and regulations, and it awards those who perform actions deemed beneficial. 
Again, notice when this was published. It was published in 2019. Now, going back further to 2015, where the plans had been revealed, we, we have the plans written for us out, for, translated for us to see evidently, to see obviously. So individuals and businesses will be scored on various aspects of their conduct, where you go, what you buy, and who you know, freedom of mobility, freedom of association, uh, freedom of um, uh, religion, freedom of, mo I already said mobility. So these scores will be integrated with a comprehensive database that not only links into government information, but also to data collected by private businesses. Ski key stakeholders, private partners, who have a vested interest to sell you stuff or to punish you for not buying their stuff. Individuals' credit score might be used in granting or withholding particular social services, barring fraudulent individuals from certain forms of business, and in order to publicly shame perpetrators of trust-breaking. Dr. James White mentioned something on Twitter this week where he said, I think of of this level of oversight, and I think of the total depravity of man, and what a terrible combination. Going on in the same article, scores will measure professional conduct, for instance, for doctors or teachers, whether or not they tell you to get vaccinated or not. It's not in the article. That was a side comment. <laughs> Commercial probidity, including the sale of substandard or counterfeit goods or, and social security. And this is, this is, the article makes this great quote. The mountains are high and the emperor far away, as the cliche goes. Yet technology is flattening the mountains and bringing the gaze of the emperor everywhere. Further to this, as I was investigating this, you, you find out that not only is it human beings who are tracking and judging you, but you are actually being judged by algorithms. So it's not just an individual who's looking over your stuff. It's an individual who writes a program, sets criteria, and then manages who you are. Algorithm scoring is everywhere. The story has been uh, spread in China because it's just the sort of behavior you'd expect from authoritarian government in China. But there's, listen to this, but there's little about the scoring system used by Sesame Credit that's unique to China. All of us are being categorized and judged by similar algorithms, both by companies and governments. The Sesame credit system is used to determine your credit score. That's what, that's what the article is referring to. In August, continuing on on the slide, Facebook was rewarded a patent on using a borrower's social network to help determine if he or she is a good credit risk. So this is already happening in North, in North America that we're being... Uh, bothered by these algorithms. And here I just have for you, I just want to read this really quickly for you. This is ripped right out of the planned outline for the construction of a social credit system produced by the Chinese government. Listen to this. All provincial autonomous region and municipal people's governments, all state council ministries and commissions all directly subordinate departments. Goes on to say, the planning outline for the construction of a social credit system is hereby issued to you. Please implement it earnestly. The party center and the state council pay high regard to the construction of a social credit system. This was published in 2014 to be implemented by 2020. 
I'll just read you, read along with you so you can read along some two excerpts from that. Completely moving the construction of a social credit system forward is an effective method to strengthen social sincerity. That's another word you should write down. Social sincerity. Stimulate mutual trust in society and reducing social contradictions. Wow. Social contradictions like the freedom of conscience. And is a social, as, as an urgent requirement for strengthening and innovating social governance and building a socialistic or socialist harmonious society. Now, listen to this next paragraph that I grabbed from it because this is going to lead us back to Canada. Listen to these words. Economic globalization. This is in the Chinese plan written in 2014. Economic globalization has enabled an incessant increase in our country's openness towards the world. And economic and social interaction with other countries and regions is becoming ever closer. Perfecting the social credit system is is a necessary condition to deepen international cooperation and exchange, establishing international brands and reputations, Reducing foreign related transaction costs and improving the country's, listen to soft power and international influence. And is an urgent requirement to promote the establishment of an objective, fair, reasonable, and balanced international credit rating system. And to adapt to the new circumstances of globalization and master new globalized structures. So the Chinese want to master their own system, proof of concept, pilot project, in order to improve their, like these are their words, soft power and international influence and master new Globalized structures, which leads us to the shirt fiasco, the beautiful shirt fiasco of the G20. So wherever you turn, our leaders are being influenced by these leaders. Uh, Going to the next, next shirt fiasco. Who in that, one of these things does not belong there. (laughs) Who, who, Who shouldn't necessarily be standing in that conversation if it is a global summit of international leaders, like, like heads of their state? Klaus Schwab. He was there the entire time, walking and schmoozing and leading because China, Canada, The Netherlands are all pilot projecting. They're all thinking out. They're all testing grounds for a new social credit system. And Ontario is a little bit behind in the sense that maybe the conservatives are going to promise up and down that it will never be systematized or, or centralized. But the federal government isn't hiding anything. Right now, they're selling it the way that Dreyer warns us for consumerism, but this is where things are going. Let's go to the next slide. So when we look at what Schwab has written in The Great Reset, I've brought some, this is a lengthy quote, but you just might as well hear it. This book was produced, I believe, by June of 2020. So I think it was published in March and it was available widely. I bought it off of Kindle in June of 2020. So this is like 15 days after we slowed the spread and saved the earth. They had a book published about what we should learn from the pandemic. Remember, Joe Biden just elongated the pandemic in the United States right now. We're still in the heart of the pandemic 
And two minutes later, or two, like two years ago, two minutes into the pandemic, they had a book published saying, what should we learn? But listen to the word. Like, these are chilling words. Ready? Here we go. It is too early to define the amount by which global carbon dioxide emissions will fall in 2020. But the International Energy Agency estimates in its Global Energy Review 2020 that they will fall by 8%. Even though this figure would correspond to the largest annual reduction on record, it is still minuscule compared to the size of the problem, and it remains inferior to the annual reduction in emissions of 7.6% over the next decade that the UN thinks is necessary to hold the global rise in temperatures below 1.5 degrees. So just pause there. We've got another very interested party, the United Nations. Now, they're, they're, they're mentioned explicitly, another partner. Corresponding, sorry, considering, listen to this paragraph. This is, considering the severity of the lockdowns, again, this was in March. How would you even know the lockdowns were severe? We hadn't even gone into our most severe lockdowns in Canada yet. But he's still calling them severe. Considering the severity of the lockdowns, the 8% figure looks rather disappointing. It seems to suggest that small individual actions, consuming much less, not using our cars and not flying, are of little significance when compared to the size of emissions generated by electricity, agriculture, and industry. The big ticket emitters that continue to operate during the lockdowns, with the partial exception of some industries. What it also reveals is that the biggest offenders, again, now just producing carbon is an offense, they've made it a sin, in terms of carbon emissions, aren't always those often perceived as the obvious culprits. A recent sustainability report shows that the total carbon emissions generated by the electricity production required to power our electric devices and transmit our data are roughly equivalent to that of the global airfare industry. The conclusion, even unprecedented and draconian lockdowns. This is in March. How would he know they were unprecedented and draconian? With a third of the population confined to their homes for more than a month came nowhere near to being a viable decarbonization strategy because even so, the world economy kept emitting large amounts of carbon dioxide. What then might such a strategy look like? The considerable size and scope of the challenge can be addressed by a combination of, and here we go, one, a radical and major systemic change in how we produce the energy we need to function. Okay, that's no surprise. Number two, structural changes in our consumption behavior. Now, he just got finished saying that even though a, world, a third of the world was locked down, it had very little to do with anything. But now point number two is structural behavior changes. Listen to what he says. In the post-pandemic era, we, if we decide to resume our lives just as before by driving the same cars and flying the same destinations and eating the same things and heating our house the same way and so on, the COVID-19 crisis will have gone to waste as far as climate policies are concerned. They want to change what you eat. They want to change what you drive, where you go. They want to change. And all at the same time, they want you to connect all of your personal information to a movement tracker. Because that's really what this is. It becomes a mobility license. And this is the major push. Michael, we're sorry to say this is the third time you've fueled up more than 200 kilometers from your home. Please return to within 200 kilometers to view, fuel your vehicle next time. And by the way, this was reported to you by the Petro Pass or like whatever, like everybody gets interconnected and reported on and this is where they're sending us. That paragraph shocked me, structural behavior change. But you know what? Last night we were just talking, a few of us were talking. 
And whether or not you support the, the movie industry or not, just be neutral on this question. How many of you don't think about going to movies anymore? Like, I just, and not for a moral reason, but because you weren't allowed to for two years, they changed your structural behavior. Like, I, there's so many things I just don't consider. I, I was talking to um, one of our key leaders in the liberty movement the other day, and he was reminding me of a story when him and I were together, and we were, we were advocating in Ohio, and he needed to be reminded, hey, you're in Ohio, you know you can fly to Texas, right? You don't have to drive. Like, he needed to be told that. He went days and days of planning a drive because he had, in his brain, been fixated so much on, I'm not allowed to fly. They're telling me I've got to finish, but I've got another 45 minutes. <laughs> and I don't like being cut off. Man, let's, everybody, take off your marks of the beast. <laughs> let's just take these off. No more compliance. Okay. Um, I'm going to finish, with, I'm gonna finish with, with, with two very, I'm going to be three minutes, okay, guys? Uh, three things. So another area that you just want to look into is then what we are also calling biodigital convergence. And again, I remember growing up with my, you know, people saying there's gonna, they're going to put, in, you know, implant, you know, chips in you and things like that. Well, it's a real thing, and we actually have an entire uh, government department in Canada, Policy Horizons Canada, uh, is an organization within the government of Canada that is exploring how to have um, a most, the most robust system of biodigital convergence. So again, it's the government of Canada all in on this. Listen to what they say. They go to the, the next slide, the, the, the three dots. Three ways biodigital convergence is emerging. Number one, physical, full physical integration of biological and digital entities. Uh, that means full integration of you, biological, and computers, digital entities. Number two, co-evolution of biological and uh, digital technologies. And three, conceptual convergence of biological and digital systems. Systems is a really important word. Now, just so you guys all know, this is on their website, possible characteristics of, bio -digital, of a biodigital system. Um, uh, the, second, the second one down there, decentralization, uh, geographic diffusion, scalability, customization, and reliance on data. So if they want to move you, like, it, it's all being said out loud. Which leads us to my last point, and this is just where. Uh, John, were you able to bring up Revelations 13? Okay. So typically I would preach a 45-minute to an hour sermon on expository, uh, exegetically explaining Revelations 13. But just let me read this out to you. And by the signs that are allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those not to worship the image of the beast to be slain. This is talking about the second beast, which is uh, the false teachers having, uh, 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 having the power to empower the first beast, which is the state, the Roman Empire, and the states to follow. Uh, I, if you want to talk biblically about this, I think some of it's in the documentary. We can go into it in further detail. So the false teachers have the ability to then push up and promote the state. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand and the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. This is the name of the beast and of the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. It is his number 666. I just want to briefly say this. As we are navigating these very difficult waters, church, family, we are called specifically as we face this problem in Scripture to face it with wisdom. Wisdom is applied knowledge. It is applying the knowledge of God, the knowledge of wor the world and history, and navigating it carefully. Wisdom is the love of wisdom. Uh, uh, like philosophy is the love of wisdom. So your church might have to develop a philosophy of bio-digital convergence, digital identity. And wrestle through, what's the church going to do? 
The second thing I want to say, and I'm, I know I'm over time, is this. It's, it's not actually talking about the thing itself. It's, it, we, we've seen all throughout history where documents have to be doctored and papers have to be papered and people actually smuggle Bibles into countries because they have the right credentials and they've been vetted the right way. It's talking about the deception of the state and the teaching itself that this is all good. Depend on man, depend on the society, do the greater good, stop thinking biblically, deny your conscience, ignore the truth, and just buy into the number of man. So this is not talking about actually trying to figure out how you navigate this very difficult new development. It's talking about buying into the system and not buying into that system. Okay, thanks everybody. You got to go quickly.